Hello, everybody. We are going to resume. I'm Ray LaHood. I'm one of the co-chairs of the High Speed Rail SAS. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am delighted to have been asked to be one of the honorary co-chairs of the High Speed Rail Task Force. And uh, Andy and Ezra and I have uh, commiserated for the last couple of years and uh, not over this meeting, but over a lot of other things. And uh, they have done a phenomenal job keeping the ball moving for high speed rail. And all of you here today, uh, we are grateful to each one of you because you are part of a team of people in America that care about high speed rail. And without your interest and enthusiasm, uh, we are we we are not going to get over the goal line. And um, so we are grateful for you spending so much time on this issue and so much interest in the issue. Uh, and uh, we we are we're going to have a lot more success because of all of you. So I want to say a special word of thanks too to Sidley for these wonderful uh, quarters that were gathered in and to, to all of the staff that you have lent us and the good food that they've prepared for us. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, it's my honor to um, introduce Congressman Rick Larson. You have his bio. Rick and I served together. When I first went to Congress, I was on the Transportation Committee for six years. And then when I went to DOT, uh, Rick and I continued our friendship and working together uh, across the aisle. He's truly a bipartisan uh, congressman. He knows the value of bipartisanship. He knows that high-speed rail is, if not the most bipartisan issue in Congress, uh, it's certainly one of them. And uh, so, uh, as you can see from Rick's bio, he's from the, the state of Washington. He's the ranking member on transportation. He's devoted his career uh, to transportation as well as serving on the Armed Services Committee. But I know that his first love uh, is transportation and he's done an awful lot for his state and for the country um, in the area of transportation. And uh, we're delighted that he took a little bit of time to come and sound off on, on some things that uh, he's interested in. and. Uh, his willingness to take a few questions. Give a warm welcome to Congressman Rick Larson. Well, th thanks, Ray. It'll be very hard to live up to that introduction, except my name is Rick Larson. I can live up to that part of it. And I'm from Washington State. Uh, all the other nice things, uh, I, I really appreciate that and appreciate Ray's uh, uh, mentor mentorship and uh, and friendship as well over the last uh, several 22 years uh, actually i've known i've known him and um i don't know if he's shared this with you as well he was a pretty pretty tough customer when he had to sit in the uh, speaker's chair and manage debate in congress when ray lahood is up there you follow the rules um you did not not follow the rules um so um good to see you and we'll see you again thursday morning i think at uh, another event so so as you noted, I'm uh, from washington state and from the second congressional district and that district is a district that's located south of the Canadian border and north of Seattle, but I don't have any of Seattle in it, although we're connected to Seattle by M the Amtrak Cascade service that runs uh, through Everett, Mount Vernon, Bellingham, and then on into Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, I wanted to talk to you today about some, uh, of course, high-speed rail, but start with generally about things I'm trying to focus on uh, as the ranking member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And I think uh, if I had to sum it up in a nutshell is that the bipartisan infrastructure law has given us a chance to build a uh, cleaner, uh, greener, safer, and more accessible transportation network than we've had in the past. To build on a foundation that was uh, built in the 1950s, but build a transportation system for the 2050s. And the BIL is only, I would say, only the first step in doing that. Uh, the president talks about the BIL being a once in a generation opportunity. I um, hate to disagree with my president, but I disagree with my president. I think tra transportation bills should be about a once every five year opportunity, like they used to be, like when Ray was around. And so that uh, we can um, um, build on sooner the work that we've already done. And as a result, I think in the next three to four years, 
uh, Congress ought to be looking at what we can do to build upon the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, in, 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 in all of its respects. But improving Im rail infrastructure is an essential component uh, to accomplish that goal. Now, before the pandemic, more than 1.3 million people boarded and departed an Amtrak train in my state, in Washington state, and uh, that was annually. That's, uh, that is 1.3 million fewer people driving or flying to get to and from a destination, meaning my state's air is cleaner and our roads are less congested, although they're really not that less congested. Um, just less congested than they otherwise would have been. Um, but without reliable and efficient rail service, communities like Everett and Edmonds and Stanwood and Mount Vernon and Bellingham and all these other cities that you've never heard of unless you're from my state uh, would not be connected to cities like Seattle, Spokane, Portland, Eugene, and Vancouver, British Columbia. Travelers between these locations only have carbon intensive options available to them without rail, which means more congestion on the roads and bridges and more carbon emissions. So last Congress, uh, last Congress, uh, Congress passed, the president signed the bipartisan infrastructure law. I'm sure you've covered some of that this morning as well, but it was a bold and is a bold and long-term investment in creating jobs, in building uh, economic growth, and as I said, building a cleaner and greener and safer and more accessible transportation system. It makes possible for the first time ever dedicated, reliable federal funding, at least for the next few years, to improve and expand intercity passenger rail. The BIL provided $66 billion and authorized another $35 billion for a total of $100 billion in funding for rail. So we got some work to do, obviously, and to set up some critical planning and governance structures for the development of passenger rail in the United States. So thanks to this investment, Amtrak is renewing and supporting routes like the Cascades route that runs through my district, a route that folks can use and do use to explore attractions in the Pacific Northwest, as well, hopefully, to get to the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, which will be held in downtown Seattle this year, and to connect Seattle and Vancouver, British Columbia, when U.S. and Canada and Mexico host the World Cup uh, games and uh, World Cup soccer in 2026. So my dream is that Amtrak will set up a special Seattle to Vancouver and back again and back again and back again. So you can just go back and forth between the two cities and watch all the soccer you want. For those who love soccer, you know what a great idea it is. For those who have no idea what soccer is, come on, join us. Um, so rail can be an important part just on for everyday life. It can be an important part as well to connect, uh, connect the world, connect the countries. But thanks to this investment, we're also finally building replacements for the 150-year-old Baltimore and Potomac Tunnel and the 110-year-old Hudson Tunnels. These two bottlenecks on the Northeast Corridor reduce train speeds and stop passengers from realizing the full benefits of higher speed rail. Thanks to this investment, last year we were able to provide over $233 million to upgrade inner city passenger rail projects, eliminating a single track bottleneck in San Diego. That's what we're doing. We're replacing deficient bridges in Michigan and funding other projects across the nation. I say we, I mean, I'm sure Amtrak and DOT are taking credit for it, but I always like to remind them like, who voted for this stuff, right? They're, they're merely implementers. Um, <clears throat> when you're in Congress, you gotta take credit. because You know what, if I want to take credit, no one's gonna give it to me, so I'll take it. <clears throat> but as the administration continues to implement the BIL, I'm focused on ensuring communities across the country can benefit from these investments. And I will continue to work with my colleagues in Congress as well to make sure the federal government is a strong partner for projects. This includes the Cascadia Rail Project in Washington State, which someday will link Seattle to Portland in as little as one hour, increasing job opportunities and enriching communities uh, along that entire route. This model of regional higher speed rail hubs can be replicated across the country. We already know it can work better in the Northeast Corridor, and we're set up for that but I wanna support similar regional rail projects across the country because that will form the basis, that will form the basis for a high-speed rail network nationwide. The FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, is currently considering applications for a number of grant programs, including uh, for $1.4 billion of CRISI, or Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements, $4.5 billion for the Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail, and just under, uh, just under $9 billion for projects on the Northeast Corridor. And last week, on May 8th, the FRA announced funding for the development of interstate rail compacts. 
a little late than I wanted, but uh, still they're out there um, and they announced the funding. Grants awarded through this IRC initiative will help fund systems planning, including the study of the impacts of freight rail operations and ownership, as well as a promotion of inner city or passenger rail operations and more. This will help us um, uh, build and grow as well a well-trained and diverse workforce that is needed to build, operate, and maintain the high-speed rail network that we want to have. The BIL expanded the allowable use of infrastructure funds to support apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship development programs, as well as on-the-job training, allowing grant recipients to work with local workforce development boards and to train the workers that we need today and in the future. And that is one of these areas that I, we just cannot neglect when we're talking about building anything, whether it's a road, a bridge, a highway, a transit system, a transit bus, an inner city rail system, a high-speed rail system. Not, it doesn't get built by magic. It gets built by people. And if we're not building the people to build these, um, these, these projects, then uh, we're going to not achieve the goals we want. So while dedicated rail funding is an important step, it's equally important to invest in a more accessible transportation network that will enable, enable people to get to and from rail hubs while cutting down our carbon footprint. For example, uh, as, an, as an example, last Congress, I secured a $2 million uh, community project funding project, uh, you know, an earmark. I don't know why people don't say earmarks around here anymore, but um, uh, I was here when we got rid of earmarks. I can understand why, but just they're simple $2 million earmark to connect uh, a pedestrian plaza and Mount Lake Terrace to the Mount Lake Terrace Sound Transit light rail station uh, through uh, a park. It's a paving uh, an ADA accessible pathway through Veterans Memorial Park and will connect the city center with the transit station. The BIL nearly doubled funding for transportation alternative programs, which fund projects like this Mount Lake, Mount Lake Terrace Transit Corridor that improve access to public transportation. We'd be have to, you know, while we're building out the system, we need to connect people to the system. And that's what I'm talking about. Um, rail, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about rail safety today because uh, the Transportation Committee um, has, a, has a jurisdiction over rail safety as well. And while that Norfolk Southern derailment in Palestine, East Palestine focused the nation's uh, attention on rail safety, it was not an isolated or rare incident. Since Just since that derailment, Norfolk Southern train conductor was killed in a rail accident in Cleveland, Ohio. The town of Raymond, Minnesota, had to be evacuated due to the, uh, due to the derailment of a BNSF train carrying highly flammable material. And a BNSF derailment on the Swinomish Reservation in Skagit County in my district spilled 3,500 gallons of diesel fuel near Pedia Bay, um, again, in my district. Over 400 elected officials, local elected officials from all over the country have sent a letter to our committee in March asking for action on rail safety, specifically to focus for them on long trains and the impact they have on our communities. I've heard from leaders of more than 12 communities in, in my state including several in specifically in my district who live along uh, the BNSF rail line with their concerns about long trains and their concerns about how first responders have difficulty reaching individuals in need of emergency care. So as ranking member and knocking on wood someday in the future as chair, we'll always place rail safety at the forefront. So I'm encouraged by the news last week, the Senate Commerce Committee uh, passed a bipartisan rail safety legislation out of committee. And once again, I call upon the TNI committee to schedule a rail safety hearing and take up bipartisan safety legislation that has already been introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives. So a little bit about the path forward, and I'll turn to questions. I mean, thanks to the BIL, we have made the largest investment in passenger rail since the founding of Amtrak more than 50 years ago. And a high quality, high speed and inner city passenger rail system is a worthy goal and continues to be our goal and continues to be my goal. We have my commitment to that. Americans need a bold and long-term investment in passenger rail infrastructure to create jobs, to drive economic growth, and to build this cleaner and greener transportation system. I think it's important to, to offer uh, some um, political reality as well. The vision for this vision for the future is far from universal. There's some uh, uh, on the other side of the aisle, not all, but on the other side of the aisle, who see any attempt to imagine a less car-centric future as a non-starter. Um, Democrats are broadly on board. There is some Republican support, uh, but we need more Republican support for federal investment in high-speed rail in the House and the Senate. So we have significant work to do to build that support. We can't 
we cannot let um, high speed rail be seen as a luxury. It has to be seen as an integral part of a functioning transportation system here in the United States. I've been in Congress in long enough, 22 years um, to know, I haven't, I haven't been in long enough, I have, but I have been in long enough to know that politics can change over time. And uh, there's a time when I know Republicans like Ray LaHood uh, regularly, uh, regularly supported Amtrak. Um, and now we have a time when some Republicans want to defund Amtrak. Um, we've had Republican presidents fully support it in the past and some not, not support it as vigorously as we want. But that just means you need to continue to tell the story, tell the story to Democrats, tell the story to Republicans. Cause I think in our, in our committee, um, we focus less on partisanship and a lot more on partnership to try to make things happen, try to move forward. Um, and I've always said as well that the best advocates for a project or a issue or a subject matter is yourself. It's not your member of Congress, it's yourself. Your member of Congress becomes an advocate if you are the advocate for that issue. And you have to really continue to be um, uh, vocal uh, to members of Congress about the support for uh, and the need for high-speed rail. And only when all of us um, buy into the transformative benefits of a robust system of national high-speed rail can we build sustainable long-term support. So I'll, I'll try to continue to do my part. I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm not. And uh, I'll call upon you to continue to do your part uh, to support high-speed rail um, because this is not, uh, like I said, we cannot look at this BIL as a once in a generation opportunity. We need to look at it as one of many first steps as we look forward to developing the next steps to develop high-speed rail in the US. So with that, thank you so much. And I've got a, time for a few questions. I will say before I take a question, I should have turned this, uh, put this computer down. It's really hard to speak when you're looking at yourself. Yeah. So, so and I try not to look at myself. I know what you see. So, <laughs> hey, any questions? Um, I want to thank you very much for your help. Um, a couple of years ago, when we were pushing for the dedicated funding for high speed rail and the reconciliation bill that came the Inflation Reduction Act, you made a key call uh, at a critical moment that helped us advance that. But ultimately, after 15 or 30 or 80 rounds of negotiations, the very final round, it got cut out uh, yeah, right. between uh, Schumer and Manchin, that negotiation. And, um, you know, how do we make it to the finish line uh, the next time there's a big legislative opportunity for high-speed rail funding? And ideally, get some funding on the scale that we, you know, 10 billion would have been great, but we're actually going to need to be thinking about 50, 100, 150 more. billion, if we're really going to be moving towards that national network you talked about. Yeah. Uh, I would just say if you're start now, if you haven't, to build the case, right? To be, and yet you have to be consistent. You have to be vocal about it. So that is part of the debate, part of the conversation um, as we, you know, again, knocking on wood, move to the next three or four years on this. I would note that. Uh, um, and, and Ray can attest to this. Uh, there are usually about 20 darkest before the dawn moments before the final deal gets done. And we burn through all 20 of those. Um, yeah. And I told you, everyone's like, oh, it's not, nothing's, yeah. So nothing, oh, it's not going to happen. It failed. It's like, it didn't fail. This is just Congress do what Congress does. Just, yeah, it's just what we do. You know, there's, I say, there's human time, the time you all live on, and there's Congress time. And that clock is like a Salvador Dali's clock that's dripping over that side. That's kind of, that's the time we live in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Andrea Giuricin, uh, professor at University of Milano Bicocca. Uh, in Europe, is, uh, you told that uh, train is not luxury. And it's true. If you go around Europe, yeah, sure. for sure, you see that the train is, uh, the high speed train, taking the train is very cheap. So it's very competitive also with the plane, for example. So if you travel from Milan to Rome, that is, Los Angeles, San Francisco, you can spend 30 euro, $30. So you can have this kind of, so of course, of course, we have to do something more here, but uh, as you told, it's not so easy to make understandable also maybe for all the people, because here there's not really the culture of use of the trade. Right. Uh, and this is uh, probably what we have to work all together. I teach also for university in Southern California. My student came from LA when they came to Italy, 
and they start to travel around Italy, they discover that it's a different way is possible. So I, I think that uh, how we can, is a, not a question just for you, but it's a question for all, how we can do more to make understandable that a different world where high-speed rail is a, an important part is a, is, a, is a possibility. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, first off, ride rail, um, obviously, um, since uh, COVID uh, in the Pacific Northwest, Amtrak has added back all the service that had been uh, cut, as well as uh, ridership continues to return. People are, people are returning to use the Amtrak Cascades program. Uh, but I think, again, we're, we're a little bit away from a national network. Um, obviously, the U.S. is much more far flung than many of the countries in Europe. Um, and so building these regional connections, I think it's going to be very important to set the, sta the st stage for the next thing that we do as we start connecting these regions. But it's, uh, we are, you know, we're not starting from where other countries have started from. Yeah, maybe one more question, someone else? Uh, or not, that's fine. Great, thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks a lot.